Ja, die Anwesenden möchte ich schon mal ganz herzlich begrüßen. Wir warten noch 10 bis 15 Sekunden, bis sich die Audiosignale verbunden haben. Das dauert manchmal ein bisschen und wir wollen ja alle mitnehmen. Wer noch in den Warteraum kommt ähm, oder wer auch ein bisschen verspätet zu uns stößt, der wird von unserer Praktikantin noch eingelassen, also keine Aufregung. Ja, aber ich glaube, die meisten Audiosignale sind soweit, dass ich sie begrüßen kann. Ja, guten Abend allerseits, herzlich willkommen zum Transatlantic Tuesday des Karl Schurz Hauses. Mein Name ist René Freudenthal aus dem Kulturprogramm des Deutsch-Amerikanischen Instituts. Ich begleite Sie heute Abend durch das Gespräch mit einem echten transatlantischen Traumduett. Friedenspreisträgerin und Bestsellerautorin Caroline Emke, deren Journal Tagebuch in Zeiten der Pandemie derzeit als epische Chronik der ersten Monate Ausnahmezustand breite Beachtung findet und begeistert besprochen wird, sowie ihr guter Freund Daniel Mendelssohn, der für den New Yorker und den New York Review of Books schreibt und zuletzt mit seinem Bestseller-Memoir eine Odyssee bei uns in Freiburg im Jahr 2019 zu Besuch war. Ganz kurz zur Technik. Lassen Sie Ihre Mikrofone bitte ausgeschaltet, damit die Audioqualität gewährleistet bleibt. Also Sie können Ihre Videos gerne anlassen und am Ende gibt es die Möglichkeit zu ein paar Fragen. Ja, worum geht es heute Abend? Was ist die Idee von diesem Abend? Die deutsche Philosophin und Saarjournalistin Caroline Imke und der amerikanische Altphilologe und große Essayist Daniel Mendelssohn schauen zurück auf ihre Erfahrungswerte und Erlebnisse zwischen Lockdown und Lockerung, Dauerkrise und Aufbruchsstimmung, Inzidenz und Kontingenz. Es geht um das neuartige Virus und seine fatalen Verheerungen, aber auch um ein Jahr, das unseren Blick auf die Welt tiefgreifend verändert hat und etliche existenzielle Fragen aufgeworfen. Welche Welt wird es sein, wenn wir vielleicht einmal alle geimpft sind? Ganz kurz zum Buch, das heute Abend natürlich mit im Mittelpunkt steht. Hier ist es. Sie kennen das Cover bestimmt, das ist gerade überall. Am 22. März 2020 beschließen Bund und Länder Kontaktbeschränkungen. Die neue Wirklichkeit der Pandemie greift tief in unseren Alltag ein und in unsere geistige Verfassung. Am Tag darauf beginnt Caroline Imke mit ihrem Journal, das in aller Munde ist. Sie notiert unmögliche Abschiede von geliebten Menschen, ihre nächtlichen Albträume. Sie schreibt über die autoritäre Versuchung des Virus, die nationalistischen Reflexe Europas analysiert sie. Es sind philosophische, subjektive Notizen, die dieser historischen Zäsur nachspüren, hier und draußen in der Welt. Ich sage noch ganz kurz was, bevor wir ins Gespräch kommen, zu den beiden Biografien. Ich habe sie zu Brühwürfeln zusammen kompromittiert. Ich könnte lange über beide Sprecher reden. Caroline Imke studierte und promovierte sich in Philosophie in London, Frankfurt und Harvard. Sie war lange Auslandsreporterin für den Spiegel und die Zeit unter anderem. Heute ist sie freie Publizistin mit Kolumnen unter anderem in der Süddeutschen Zeitung und El Pais. Ihre Bücher, darunter wie, wie wir begehren, weil es sagbar ist und gegen den Hass, wurden weltweit in über zehn Sprachen übersetzt. Seit über 15 Jahren kuratiert und moderiert Caroline Imke den Streitraum an der Schaubühne Berlin. 2016 erhielt sie, das werden Sie alle wissen, den Friedenspreis des deutschen Buchhandels. Sie äh, erhielt außerdem sehr, sehr, sehr viele Preise. Ich könnte 15 Minuten lang aufzählen. Ich nenne einfach nur beispielhaft den Johann Heinrich Merck Preis und den Karl von Ossietzky Preis. Daniel Mendelssohn promovierte in Altphilologie in Princeton und arbeitet heute als Memorist, Essayist, Kritiker, Kolumnist und Übersetzer. Er schreibt für etliche der wichtigsten amerikanischen Magazine, vor allem aber für den New Yorker und für den New York Review of Books, wo er seit 2019 auch Editor at Large ist. Zu seinen wichtigsten Buchveröffentlichungen, ich nenne die englischen Titel, zählen The Elusive Embrace, Desire and the Riddle of Identity, The Lost, A Search of Six, for Six of Six Million und An Odyssey, A Father, A Son and an Epic. Den deutschen Titel erwähnte ich schon. Zu seinen ebenfalls sehr, sehr vielen Preisen zählen der National Book Critics Circle Award, die James Madison Medaille der University of Princeton und der Prix Mediterranee. Er lehrt Literatur am renommierten Bard College. Now my mouth is already dry, um, but, we, <laughs> but we are so delighted to have you with us. Caroline Imke and Daniel Mendelssohn, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having us. 
So um, I tried to order the evening in three um, thematic blocks. Um, the first is called Shock and Aftershock. Um, the second is called Society and Selfhood. And the third is called History and Myth. And I hope we can make it as seamless um, as possible. I'll try, try my best. But I want to start in the very beginning. Um, so Freiburg, where I am and where Karl Schutzhaus is, was the first major city in Germany to impose a kind of um, confinement, um, kind of, in mid-March of last year. Um, and I still remember in late afternoon of the first day of this kind of confinement, um, which wasn't really one, but we didn't know at the time, I left my house for one of those government allowed walks. And I felt a kind of bodily shock because I live, I live in a very beautiful, place um, in town, um, lots of old buildings, lots of flowers and plants, um, busy streets usually, but it was eerily quiet. Um, the whole atmosphere had basically changed and I could, I could feel it in my, in my gut basically. And like the one thing that was missing was dead birds dropping from the sky like in Chernobyl. Um, so I was wondering for both of you on both sides of the Atlantic, if there was like this one moment for you where, where it just hit you that the old world is gone and the new world in a way has begun or was it more of a process for you? Hmm. Well, I have to say in my case, it was a very mundane experience. Um, the, the moment, you know, when it became clear that things were very different and it, it began almost as a joke, you know, it's, given how we, how much we have all gone through by now, it's almost difficult to remember the beginning of this uh, because there have been so many phases since then. Um, but I remember I, I early March and people were sort of still joking a little bit because nobody knew how serious this thing was certainly here. I mean, it, it, it obviously hit Europe harder first. Um, and so people would see each other and they would sort of bump elbows with a little bit of a laugh and not know what to do. And I, it, there came a day in mid-March, I remember when there was a, a sort of official uh, uh, announcement from New York State, uh, the government saying that people should start stocking up on groceries. On, on essential groceries. And my partner and I rather self-consciously, because it did feel a bit like a science fiction movie, we went to the supermarket thinking, okay, you know, we'll, we'll stock up on things. And everything had been emptied out. You know, there, there were just certain items that were completely vanished. And that I remember thinking, okay, we're in something knew, you know, there had clearly been a, a kind of a panic. And that was scary. I remember thinking that was really rather frightening. And at that point, you just, you felt that you had sort of slid into a new way of living. And then it all happened so fast after that. But that was the first thing I remember feeling different. Um, I think I would probably distinguish between the moment when I consciously realized, uh, uh, you know, there is that this is an historic moment. This is a historic phase, a historic experience, and the the moments when I unconsciously already prepared myself. Uh, for something that I, I think now would detect as, look, these were already practices or gestures or reflexes that indicated you were preparing yourself for something uh, terrible. I think the conscious moment was, uh, and that's, I mean, was when Angela Merkel spoke on television. As everybody knows, I mean, she, there's one thing she dislikes and that is speaking uh, and explaining uh, her political intuitions or decisions. So the fact that Angela Merkel would speak on television was you know, in itself outrageous, so to speak. And I remember that moment sitting there 
and you know her her discomfort was with speaking uh, uh, translated into the knowledge. This is an historic uh, moment, and the um, not so conscious uh, situations were um, reflexes um, and. Um, it was, for me, it was, I immediately took a map, which is what I used to do when I traveled to regions of crisis. And I, and I walked with the map through my neighborhood. Uh, and I wanted to witness how it looked at the moment. So I would remember that and could compare it to a year later or two years later or three years later. So I, I realized it, it, it will be something that I will mourn, mm -hmm. you know, it's, and evidently, I mean, the fact that it was a reflex that, that had been trained in different contexts, mm -hmm. uh, of crisis now makes me uh, realize, oh, that was something where I, I in, sort of intuitively, um, you know, referred or cited a practice that, that was trained in, in, in war zones or on, on areas of crisis. And I think that happens very, very often. And I think probably an older generation had that even even maybe even more consciously, but um, it's these, I think it's very often gestures or my father would still till the end of his life uh, switch the radio station before he turned off the radio because he was trained that the neighbors would not be able to see what kind of station the parents were listening to. And it's, it's you know it's 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 a practice that was trained under certain circumstances in extreme situations and and much later you can still get a sense for the vulnerability and and that is i think what many of us could detect in in these first weeks that there were ref just like daniel described i mean the halting i mean uh, evidently that was not necessary but people thought it would be necessary yeah. Yes, and I think also, you know, if one has any sense of history, which I think obviously both of us do in, in different ways, um, I, as a student of ancient history, am always interested in, and of other histories as well, you know, watching mass behavior is always a very interesting phenomenon. You know, it's it's when you read, and I, I know we'll be talking about this later, but when you read about the history of great plagues, the responses are always the same. It doesn't matter what technology you have, you know, what gadgets you have, it's a very primitive impulse. And I think this hoard, that's why I thought this hoarding was so alarming to me because it immediately put you in a, in a known historical mode. You know, people regress. And you know every every person is in their own cave, getting as much stuff as they can, and that I found very disturbing. And that actually brings me to um, my next question, um, which deals with these kind of. It might have felt different in the states, but in Germany, I think there was a palpable sense of uh, things being very much in jeopardy, um, almost like on, on the edge of the abyss in a way. I think um, it might be comparable to the US when I remember like the New York Times front page with these giant unemployment um, data um, visual, visuals basically, where you thought, well, now all bets are off and I don't know what this is, what we're all gonna do in a year's time. and. It seems to me, in a way, at least Western societies have kind of muddled through in different ways, but this kind of new world is not yet born in a way, and we don't know if it will. And um, I'm quoting him because I think you both would 
probably disagree with him um, a little bit at least, but the very controversial French um, author Michel Houellebecq has coined this um, phrase, um, well, the next phase will be about the same, but a little bit worse. So does that uh, strike you as a correct note or is it far off from your own future views, views of the future? I think I, I would say that in a very perverse way, an advantage that we had here at the beginning of the crisis is that we were already in crisis mode because of the political situation. I mean, you know, those of us who felt that the Trump presidency was an unprecedented disaster were already living on the edge of our mm -hmm. intellectual, political, mm -hmm. and moral resources. And so in a funny way, we were already so keyed up that the, the COVID crisis, I think, in a funny way, did not hit as hard as it would have hit because we were already in crisis mode. As you know, the beginning of last year was the beginning of a year in which we were having an extremely important presidential election. So we were already so keyed up and so agitated. I, I as a person who's interested in history, I, I'm very leery of making predictions, um, but I do think Look, I think there are two, um, the two say strands of this tapestry that interest me particularly are the, the sort of obviously the socioeconomic picture, which I don't even think we have a, a means of gauging yet what the damage is. I, I mean, here, you know, people keep talking about the stock market and how great the stock market is, as if that were the only indicator of economic health. That tends to be a great American mistake. Um, but we don't know. There are so many industries that have been so devastated by this. I don't think there's any way to know. Uh, uh, and of course, because an economy is an elaborate mechanism, everything trickles into everything else. The housing markets, the rental markets, the real estate markets, you know, there's no way of knowing. And that is gonna be very interesting, particularly, and I'm speaking here for America, as we come out of, I hope, this nightmarish four year period, it will be interesting to see how these socioeconomic factors continue to affect our politics. Can I ask you, uh, yeah. when you say, I hope, how skeptical are you? Well, I think, uh, look, I mean, speaking in very broad terms, we know historically that economic disasters inevitably have a dire effect on politics. Ah, uh, sorry, uh, I'm, I thought you meant uh, the, the the transition from the Trump era to the Biden. I, I no, 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 I'm, I, I, okay. I, I, totally, but I'm going to, so what I'm saying is, you know, so on the one hand, there's a great sigh of relief because now there are competent people running the country. On the other hand, I think precisely because the economy is still in a sort of uh, wait and see mode, I don't think we're out of the woods yet. I, yeah. I, I really think that, you know, the same economic conditions that produced Trump to some extent uh, have not gone away and in fact are exacerbated. So I, I, I feel we should not be lulled into a false sense of security because these things are very powerful and there are a lot of disenfranchised uh, uh, people still out there. But the other thing, and then I'll shut up, the other thing um, I think is interesting is the long-term effects, uh, social effects of, you know, uh, Zoom, remote communicate, you know, all these things that began as emergency technological fixes are obviously going to now stick with us. It always happens that way. So I think there might be very positive benefits actually, you know, certainly for example, as an educator, remote education is an incredible tool, uh, you, you know, for a lot of people. So I'm very interested to see how 
the accommodations that had to be made in a remote culture will continue to evolve and revolutionize. Look, it's already revolutionizing the workplace. People will be working from home in much greater numbers than ever before because they realize that they can. So I think those things will be very interesting to track. And of course, there are many of them. Um, <clears throat> I'm sort of as reluctant as Daniel is to, you know, to come up with projections or, or scenarios. Um, A, because I'm always terrible in it, yeah. really terrible. Um, but also because my impression is that the longer this pandemic uh, state of exception la lasted, um, the dumber I got. <laughs> um, I felt in the beginning, you know, one was one was trying to. Uh, you know, analyze a new situation, the, 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 the political situation, the social situation, evidently also a little bit trying to understand what this kind, you know, what this virus and this illness was at all. But my impression was, at least from my own experience, that the longer this lasted, um, the less, I mean, I mean, I, I, I felt I learned a lot in the first couple of weeks, and then I learned less and less. And uh, if I take the example of the 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 election in the U.S. and, and you know, evidently in the weeks mm. after it, um, I don't think we have really come to terms with understanding what this was. And if I look at myself. Um, when it was finally declared, uh, you know, the results were you know, evidently they're still not accepted, but when they were finally declared, I wasn't even relieved. I, I, it, I, I felt this, this holding oneself together throughout these four years, this trying to stay sane in these years um it ju I ju I, you know it's like when when you have cold frozen feet and you put them in the warm water finally and it hurts at the first that's how it felt so i felt the the se the sense of i mean evidently of course i was also happy you know uh, and, and and relieved but um the, the level of reflection and analysis that is needed to understand the Trumpism beyond Trump, um, the, uh, I, I think that's what needs to be done. And I felt because of COVID and, you know, evidently also because of Biden, you know, and the transition, mm -hmm. I, I felt people were trying to jump into a new you know phase uh and yeah you know what i mean yeah 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 i i mean i think also it's a i think <laughs> i think the people on whom one wants to rely for you know journalists thinkers writers intellectuals on whom one wants to rely for clarity in a kind of situation like this, which is extremely unclear, which I was trying to convey earlier, are unfortunately, uh, I, I don't, partly because of the kind of culture in which we now live, in which there is a great demand for instantaneous commentary. And, you know, I'm old fashioned. And I think that sometimes you need to wait and think about something before you actually can comment on it. And there, I don't think there's been, um, for obvious reasons, and some of them are very touching, you know, intellectuals and writers and thinkers also get, you know, worked up and, and lose their sense of clarity. But I do think, it, at least in this country, the relief simply that Trump was voted out 
was so great that I think I, I haven't seen the amount of follow through that I would like to see mm. in terms of judging the larger situation, because yes. it's already clear that getting rid of Trump is not a total solution to the problem, that the pro Trump is a symptom and not the problem. Yeah. So. If you would uh, let me jump in there, I wanted to disagree about the um, being bad at predictions <laughs> statement because I think um, what makes the book, um, and I've already um, held it into, uh, what makes the book really remarkable, and I'm not the first person to say that, um, of course, but um, I've also noticed it um, is, I mean, it describes the very first few weeks of the pandemic in Germany. And I think looking back at this very distinctive period of time, um, especially in Germany, because we had this long summer of the pandemic being declared over. Uh, and it's in the book, the end um, of this first phase of, of the pandemic is in the book. Um, in this distinctive period, everybody was like busy with their own little pandemic rituals and hobbies and people started with sourdough and posting pictures oh. in suits to Instagram and people were suddenly doing puzzles and people were doing like their um, toilet paper shopping in Germany, which was a big thing. And I, I, think, I think people were so curled up in this and trying to um, grasp something of this new reality that it's quite remarkable how much of what's to come you already thought about in these first few weeks. And I was wondering, um, was that something from the gut? You thought about this and it came up and you, you, you saw what would come? Or is it something, is it a process of thinking, researching, trying to deal with this? Because I mean, there's a afterward um, from November of last year in the book, um, and it just confirms um, how interesting and, and thought provoking and, and future oriented your thoughts in these weeks already were. Well, I think um, I mean, I think on one hand, when it uh, when it started, I think the my major uh, illusion about the pandemic, uh, and it, I think it was an illusion that was nurtured by the first responses, was, oh, this is finally a phenomenon that is perceived internationally, that is analyzed globally, that, you know, will uh, need and require and finally generate uh, international coordination and cooperation. And I think... Um, for someone, I mean, for, for someone like me, where, where, where friends are in very different uh, uh, places in the world, uh, evidently that's not just, you know, an analytical or political uh, uh, concern, but it is something that, that uh, you know, that, that basically means practically that you call and, you know, and write and, and want to hear from friends wherever they are, what the, you know, what the situation is like in New Orleans or Harlem or uh, Beirut or, or Medellin. And so, so I think part of the concern that I had from the start was that the, the, the forced provincialization that the lockdown meant, the forced um, autofocus that everyone is paying attention to, you know, one's household as it's suddenly called. I mean, that's, isn't, isn't that the most square thing? I mean, to think about households and not, I don't know, affairs or relationships or family. I mean, I hated this, but um, this, this, I think what I wanted from the start was to argue against this autofocus. Um, and I, th I think the biggest uh, illusion I had is that this international uh, perspective would, would hold uh, longer. And, and you could see <laughs> you know, very quickly, I think in the US, uh, uh, I mean, to me also surprisingly in the Biden administration, um, what a nationalistic uh, response there was to to the question of exporting uh, 
you know, uh, vaccine. Um, but I think that's my biggest disappointment also and where was was utterly wrong. Um, yeah. Yeah. But that's what I mean. You know, that's what I meant, Caroline, when I was talking before about that regressive quality that rises to the surface. You know, I, I, I came of age in my early 20s as a young gay man living in New York as the AIDS crisis. Yeah. Came. And that experience I felt allowed me to make one prediction, which is that whatever else is true, this kind of um, primitive, uh, you know, as we say, gut response to a, an epidemic or a pandemic uh, reveals the stress fractures in, yeah. in a given polity. That I knew would happen, whatever they were. You know, it just lays bare the structure of a polity. And we've seen that, you know, it, it, I mean, here to take a banal example, this unbelievable uh, uh, politicization of mask wearing and vaccines and all of that. You know, everything that's been wrong rose to the surface. It's like injecting a dye into the body politic and suddenly you can see these currents coursing through, the irrationality, the uh, anti-scientific thinking, this sort of primitive regression. So that, that was one prediction I could mm -hmm. make based on my own personal experience, is that these things tend to bring out, uh, you know, it's like dying. I always, I always joke with my, dying doesn't change you, it just makes you more who you were before. And I think that's what epidemics do too. It really laid bare some of the very essential issues with this country. Yes, I mean, well, but the interesting is I, I, you know, I completely agree. My favorite example is always the UK, uh, because <laughs> there you could really see what, you know, a, a totally deregulated, privatized, yeah. uh, neoliberal uh, uh, society uh, would look like and how much uh, you know, the social grammar of a society had been subverted since, you know, Thatcher. Um, yeah. And uh, I have to admit, you know, I don't have schadenfreude, but I have to admit I was at least glad that it became obvious. Um, but I think that there is no acknowledging of that so right. so so what is so amazing to me is you see exactly what you've said you see all the structural conditions of suffering you see the structural conditions of inequality you see who is forgotten in these uh, yeah, yeah. times and you also see what kind of structures or institutions um would help and it may help or it may have helped, you know, for a couple of months. Uh, and yet it has politically absolutely no consequence. Right. Right. And, and, and that is so amazing. I mean, to some extent you could say, oh, excellent. You know, we have this pandemic and unfortunately and alas and sadly it causes so much pain and, you know, such terrible loss but at least we could learn from it. Uh, and I, you know, even though we're still in the pandemic, I don't see any of that. I, oh. I, I, and that's what I mean. I mean, it just, uh, 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 it just has laid bare what we always knew was true about this country in particular. And I'm sure you're all very well aware that health care in particular is an unbelievably disastrous, situation here in the United States. And, and I, I guess a not very nice part of me was thinking when this began, you know, well, maybe this is what it's going to take mm. to get these people to understand why there needs to be 
a coherent and humane healthcare system of some kind in this country and nothing happened. It's already fading away. You know, I mean, look, we know what the issues are. And that's what I meant when I said these crises, these crises just bring these things out, the, the underlying DNA of the national psyche more than ever, but it doesn't cure them because that's mm -hmm. the national psyche and people will explain away anything that that conflicts with their idea, their pre-existing idea of what ought to be the case. And that's been a huge disappointment. You know, it's already fading away. Um, and if this, if this global catastrophe, which is at once epidemiological, social and economic, doesn't get people to see what the problems are, I do not know what would. Yeah, I don't know how that is in the US, but here the discussion at the moment, at least seems to me is, is always focused on um, the summer or the fall. Everybody speaks about the afterwards, you know the afterwards, and afterwards seems to start at least in the in the in the you know uh, in the public uh, debate. Afterwards seems to start when the majority of people are vaccinated uh, in this country. Um, there's no sense of an international global pandemic anymore. It's it's. I mean, there will be no afterwards until you know, the global south or, or you, know, uh, you know, will also receive vaccination. But that is, it's as if, I don't know, the analytical tools to, to, to analyze international phenomena is amputated <laughs> again. Yeah. Um, and I, what I would like to, could I ask you about the experience of the AIDS crisis a little bit more? Well, I was actually going to say that the, the what you were just saying, Caroline, makes me, again, AIDS is, a, is unfortunately a very good model for what you're talking about because, you know, there was, I'm obviously speaking in extremely broad generalizations here, but, you know, AIDS was in fact a global crisis and particularly a crisis in developing nations. But if you live in the United States, you would think it was over once they developed the cocktail you know, and then people stop thinking about it. And so I think, you know, here again, I think, um, you know, what you're describing, Caroline, as a, a failure to think globally, which one would have expected to be corrected by this global crisis. We've seen it again, and I'm sure we've seen it before, and I, I'm unfortunately quite certain that we will see it again, because these crises do bring out a sort of primitive territorial as you were saying before, nationalistic impulse. You know, you have to take care of your tribe um, and that's enough. Yeah, it's interesting as someone um, who has not lived through the AIDS crisis in a way you have, um, it has, It, it has been, for me, it has been a reference point of, um, I don't, you know, I, I usually don't, you know, I usually don't have really a sense of being proud of being gay. I mean, I, I don't really relate to the, this terminology, but the one thing that I really can refer to and, and, and that uh, gives me a great sense of, uh, respect and joy is to say this, you know, the, the way, um, you know, the ACT UP movement, I mean, the, the whole, you know, gay movement responded to the AIDS crisis is something that I can relate to and that fills me to some extent with pride. Um, and yeah. when I, when the, does that make sense? I mean. Oh, no, no, no. I'm totally with you, but that had to happen because nobody was else going to, nobody exactly. else was going to do it for us. Because you know what? When did uh, uh, COVID appear at the beginning of 2020? And we have a vaccine in a year and a half, in a year. Yes, yes. One year. Exactly. And, 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 and I think- say 
when when the perception was that gay people were the only people dying of AIDS, there was no vaccine in one year. Yeah, it would, you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that urgent. Um, no, but that's exactly what I wanted to know, what I'm curious about to hear from you. When, when COVID started and suddenly, you know, there was word of people being positive um, and it wasn't a stigma. It, it was, you know, there was, you know, public recognition and it also solidarity. And, and you know, uh, I wondered what that, you know, if you were angry about this or if you laughed or if it, you know, what was your response? Well, I, I would say I viewed the thing with the raised eyebrow. Yeah. Um, remembering what it was like 40 years ago when nobody cared and the stigmatization was unbelievably powerful and people were being thrown out of their houses and let you know allowed to die in in taxi stands and airports and you know so obviously it's a bitter comparison yeah. um, but look I'm also the child of a scientist and so I'm very happy that, oh. especially given in an, given in it, we we have come out of four years of anti-science and the denigration of every kind of political uh, intellectual activity. So the triumph of the development of the vaccine, I I personally celebrated uh, as a sort of fuck you, excuse me, to these um, you know, these anti-science, anti-vaxxers, primitive uh, kinds of people. If you let me jump in here, um, because I think that um, uh, frames maybe what you've both talked about with each other now. Um, something that um, struck me while reading the book is how often the most used pronouns in the book actually were we and us instead of I, which is usually the position of someone writing a journal. And I'm sure there was mm -hmm. at least a um, half conscious decision. Um, but I think it also makes a point about um, these kinds of collect collective identities. And I, th I know that's something that uh, um, busied you for decades now in your work uh, in its different phases. Um, and of course, a collective identity can, can be that of a whole society or of a subgroup, like the people um, who were getting sick of AIDS, for example. Um, and I like, kind of contrapose this to this kind of um, idealized American I, like the individualism of American society, which to many Europeans um, in 2020 seem to be part of the problem. Like um, if I am the only person in my world, I don't need to wear a mask if um, I don't feel mm -hmm. sick. And yeah. I think there were many commentators who say this might be the end of individualism because everybody sees it failing under Trump, of course, but also because it's ingrained in American society. And now a year on, this doesn't seem to have happened, does it? And is it different in Germany? Well, I, I mean, I, I can't speak for Germany and I'm sure Caroline can, but uh, honestly, I don't see any difference. This is what I was talking about before when I talk about the DNA of a culture. You know, this is our DNA that, uh, you know, individualistic frontier, mentality. I do it myself. You know, I did it myself. I do it myself. You know, I don't need the government. I did it myself. You know, and this, this, you can't, you can't make that go away. It is the fundamental uh, quality, I think, of a certain American mentality. You know, even that whole mask, you know, the mask thing was a perfect expression of of this, you know, what it, me, 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 you know, no thought that you might be protecting someone else, right? Um, and that's what I despair about, you know. Look, we see it in so many ways in this country. Look at our gun situation, you know, no amount of mass shootings is ever going to solve this problem because at some primitive fundamental level, you know, this is a country where people feel it's important to have guns and, and no amount of proof, demonstration, rational argument is going to make that go away. So that's been, um, you know, again, it, 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 these elemental qualities are brought to the surface by these kinds of crises.
they are not dissolved to make way for something better because that's not how people act, unfortunately. Um, I would like to suggest that independent of what Daniel was just saying about sort of the American DNA of individualism and evidently also I think the, the, the lack of a social welfare state structure in the US. Um, I, I think what we should um, take into account also independent of the American situation is we do have an international movement uh, that is anti-scientific, anti-enlightenment, anti-modern, neo-fascist, uh, that uh, promotes um, culturally or ethnically uh, a dogma of purity um, that uh, permanently uh, uh, invokes um, a past that was allegedly uh, culturally homogenous, allegedly, uh, you know, uh, better. And um, I think, so, 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 so I, I would say, I mean, and we see that, you know, in Russia, we see that in uh, Brazil, uh, we see it in Europe, um, not that much in the government, but we see these movements uh, that are connected, uh, that communicate internationally, uh, that um, share the same um, references. Sometimes uh, the references are national socialism. Sometimes the references are, you know, depending on the context, uh, 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 you know, are different historic faces. Um, they. Um, uh, I mean, they 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 they, they uh, promote uh, military regimes. They promote the junta uh, uh, epoch, and so I think we have to take that also into account. And whereas in the beginning of the crisis, um, uh, I thought it was wonderful to see these uh, movements. Uh, who permanently had a racist biopolitical agenda uh, and also permanently had racist, um, I would say almost hypochondriac uh, understanding of identity, permanently worried about getting contaminated by an other and by foreigners yeah. and by Jews and by gays. Um, suddenly there was a real biopolitical crisis. Uh, there really was an, you know, something that would, uh, you know, th that would get the, you exposed to something scary. And they totally lost it. They absolutely did not know how to respond to it. Uh, in the German context, it's quite interesting because the IFD um, reversed their understanding of the virus. At first, they took it very seriously, but then they wanted to connect to this anti-scientific, uh, anti-enlightened mm -hmm. global movement. And so they, they switched their whole uh, political response to COVID uh, and, 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 and then criticized the government for taking it too seriously. So, yeah. um, so I think... Um, and, and this connects to what Daniel and I were saying before. I think part of our, you know, political analysis and the political focus has to be on these on these movements because they continue, and now we see them even thrive, um, mm. because they connect with those segments of society that are I don't know. Uh, worried, uh, disoriented, pa feel powerless. So, so I think there's, that is something that we still have to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, I would like to uh, let the audience know that at the very end, and it is fast approaching already um, because the conversation was so lively, um, I will pose one or two audience questions to our guests um, and you can type them down now if you would like to be under consideration. Um, I would like to jump back in history for a second 
um, maybe to connect the two of you, one very um, concerned with um, current affairs and one also looking back into um, ancient mm -hmm. history even. Um, as many people I've read up on uh, historic plagues like a maniac over the last year, um, of course, 1918 is on everybody's minds, but there's of course 1438 where a third of Europeans died. People don't know that, I think. Many people didn't know that before um, last year. And this uh, led to basically the Renaissance and the creation of the middle classes, some people argue. Um, mm -hmm. And back into antiquity, there's the big um, plague in the fifth century in Athens that killed Pericles. Um, and devastated like the first democracy on earth, which is also connected to what Caroline Emke just talked about um, as dangerous to democracy in, a, in, a, in an interesting parallel. And this also gets me back to the meaning of a plague. And I think that's something so strong also in a, in a very primitive way in people. They want to search for meaning in plagues, even if they're not religious. And um, what came to mind is Sophocles for me, because Oedipus, of course, Oedipus um, begins with a plague and um, the plague needs to be solved and there's religious pollution. Uh, I was wondering what you, Daniel, um, thought about the, uh, I mean, it's a very current thing, it's happening now, but it also connects back to history and maybe um, you both have ideas about this, but of course you are the obvious starting point. Well, I mean, the, you, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think the, you know, the impulse to personalize and to uh, to assign, you know, to take a plague, which as we know is a random epidemiological event and the microbes don't care how nice we are, how good we are, how moral we are, but it's almost inevitable, you know, that we interpret them as, as meaningful you know that we we attach meaning to them this goes back as you say to the or in certainly the earliest moments of western civilization and literature i would remind everyone that in fact the iliad which is a fundamental uh, a, a moment at the beginning of western literature begins with a play uh, uh, as you say, also Sophocles' Oedipus begins with a plague. And we feel that a plague, because thinking back to a moment before people had an understanding of, of how germs worked, right? We, we feel it as a blow, which is what the word plague means, a blow. Um, and notice, you know, there are all over the place monuments to plagues because they feel like they come out of nowhere and that they're a punishment. You know, how many pest zoilen are there all over Central Europe, Central Europe, right? That we feel that it's a blow from above and therefore it ought to make one think. And, and that's irresistible. Even someone like Thucydides who is, you know, thought of as the most rationalistic of ancient historians, and certainly in someone who's interested in getting to the bottom of historical phenomena without recourse to supernatural explanations, is quite dazzled by the plague that struck Athens. Um, and so I think you know, we've seen it, unfortunately, in various ugly ways, and this connects to something Caroline was just saying, you know, that the, the, the way, for example, this plague, COVID, has already been politicized, right? The China plague, you know, it's been used for political purposes. And this is what we do as humans, because as humans, we, we need to make meaning out of random events. And so it's a punishment, we're too corrupt. You know, if you, you, you yourself, Renee, named some of the one, the Black Death in the 14th century, if you look at Boccaccio, what's interesting to me, uh, as I said before, if, if you look at the history of this plague, if you look at Thucydides' description of the plague that decimated Athens, and if you read the introduction to Boccaccio's Decameron, identical, identical, reaction on the part of the people, I, it's unbelievable, right? And so from my interests, 
what I find so fascinating, as I said at the very beginning of this conversation, is the way that there is something about this mass infection which causes us to revert to a, 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 a kind of primitive model of behavior. You know, Thucydides, Boccaccio, they all describe how people abandoned, you know, civilized behavior, the bodies were left out in the street with no one to take care of them. Some people abandoned themselves to pleasure. Some people hid and, and you know, became isolated. But it's just fascinating because it, it's like a laboratory in which you get to see something fundamental about how humans act. Could I ask you, were you always aware how... Um how much the issue of the of plagues of illnesses of uh not death but but say, say that that plague how much that was in these texts present or was that something that you realized now well i think uh, you know it's inter it's a very interesting question i would say as in many um instances in which something that we experience in literature suddenly happens in real life. One, so I could say I was always aware of them, but one certainly experiences these works of literature differently, having lived through a moment that is exactly parallel to the moment that's being described. I, 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 it certainly you know, as you know, at the beginning of this crisis, I started tweeting translations of, yeah. of Boccaccio's Decameron, the beginning parts which describe the play because I was so electrified by the similarities, you know? And I always think it's good to remind people that, you know, things keep happening in throughout history. King, things keep cycling back. And I certainly appreciate those moments in a very, I would say clearly much more powerful way than I ever did. Or. Yeah, I, I, I have to say I loved it when you when you started doing this, but it also to me it 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 I, I didn't I didn't have that present at all. Uh so so um and I think what what um touched me really about this was on one hand you just sitting I mean just the ritual of sitting there and translating but the the other aspect was that i think this crisis uh, this um particular pandemic but probably also the expo historic experiences um i i think they caused something like narcissistic injury uh to, to our times uh i think there is also uh uh it's it's unacceptable that something is uncontrollable. Yes. I think in German we would say unverfügbar, so uh -huh. that is not in our hands. And I think this, the ability to accept something that is not in our hands um, yeah. has, has disappeared. Um, and and that that is that is to me the explanation why the also the the, the cultural knowledge or the literary knowledge uh, or consciousness of this being an experience that uh, you know has repeated itself over the course of history is negated um and yeah and and and, and of course writing a journal in this year for me also meant i want to make sure that this is it will be forgotten again but at least there is some kind yeah. of testimony to the experience yeah but i mean it's very interesting what you say caroline because that i urge everyone listening to read sophocles oedipus because that's why he is the smartest person that's his great distinguishing characteristic, is his great intellect, because Sophocles understood what Caroline was just saying, which is the sense of incredulity that the greatest mind is still inadequate to handle this blow that falls from the sky out of nowhere. That's what the 
you know, that's certainly one of the things the play is about, that sense that civilization, as high as it becomes, is still not always enough to, to deal with this sense of dismay when things randomly fall on us. Yeah, and I think it's also, sorry. No, 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 go ahead. Sorry, no, uh, 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 I would also say we need to um, ask ourselves the question, uh, how we respond to um, extreme situations that are that are caused by, um, you know, amoral behavior or evil, uh, and how incredulous we are because we don't, ex you know, we don't <laughs> expect it. Uh, uh, you, you may re uh, remember. Uh, Primo Levi, um, when he described the first days uh, in Auschwitz, uh, he had a, a friend who had been in Auschwitz uh, longer uh, th than himself and who, who told him in the, in the beginning, ne pas chercher à comprendre. You know, don't tr you know? Don't try to understand. You know, if 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 you try to 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 make sense out of this, it will completely destroy you. Right. And um, and the other experience is to to experience uh, an extreme situation that is random, that that has no meaning, uh, that, that is not caused right. by humans, and how incredulous. Uh, we, we, you know, we are in those situations, and yeah. I think it. I think the, the 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 it has enormous political, social, psychic, and moral consequences to compare these two. Sure. Um, if I may um, get back to um, what you've just said about um, keeping a journal in these times to kind of bear witness. Those were not your words, but mine. Um, but I think that's what you're getting at. Maybe as a kind of um, coming um, to a close, I was wondering, I don't, I'm not sure if you've commented on that yet, but um, there are quite a few examples for pandemic journals in, um, in literary history. For example, Daniel Defoe's um, Journal of a Plague Year, obviously, which even has part of the name of your book in its um, title. And there are also many plague novels um, which came back into conscience. I mean, you were writing before most of them became hits again, but um, people were re reading um, Camus' um, uh, plague, of course. Uh, Mary Shelley came back to the uh, forefront. Um, Saramago, um, The City of the Blind, is also kind of plague novel. And I was wondering if any of those influenced you because your book is full of quotes also. Like you, it's obvious how much other thinkers inspire your writing. Um, no, I did not. I did not. Um, you know, some of these texts I, I know or knew before writing. Um, some I didn't. Daniel Defoe, I didn't know before. Mm. Um, um, no, I th I think I I did really, and I, I'm not usually a journal writer. I mean, I'm not a journal writer. I, I I don't have that as a as a practice. But I did think that this particular crisis um, uh, was best served or best understood uh, uh, in a journal because evidently it was. So it, it it had such personal effects. It it it, it had fa effects on, you know, the modes of touching, the the the, the code, the bodily codes uh, with which we met each other, uh, and at the same time, it had such political, social uh, consequences that I felt um, I would need the most hybrid genre. The, 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 that would allow for, um, yeah, all kinds of writing. Um, and the, I think that the major problem with a journal, if you know that you're going to publish it, I mean, evidently that's a huge, that's a huge question. Do you really write for yourself? Is it really intimate or do you know that it's going to be published? I knew it was going to 
yeah. be published. But I think the major difficulty is that you know you will get things wrong, that you know some days you will focus on something very intimate and afterwards you think, fuck, you know, why didn't I? So, And I, I, I think... Uh, you know, you just have to be. Uh, I don't know. There's there's a set of chutzpah that you need for for writing. That's out. also. I would say also, Caroline. However, that that is why people like to read them because one wants the sense of the immediacy and the not knowing. That's why you read a someone's journal. You know, not not because it's a history of the event but because one also has, a, as it were, a normal life that still is being lived despite this yeah. cataclysmic historical event. I would also just add, as someone who is very interested in personal writing, that the journal seems to me to lend itself particularly to these plague years because the plague itself, right, we chart the progress of a fever or an illness. So there's something about the fact that this is an illness that seems to lend itself. It has a course. We talk about the illness running its course. So a daily uh, or at least regular um, genre seems to, to be ideal because we want a sense of the thing progressing, which is what it does. You know, it, 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 it begins, it reaches a crescendo, it burns itself out. And so it, the event has a sort of natural shape that other historical events don't necessarily, which seems to demand this day-by-day -day accounting, so to speak. Yeah, I think what, what helped me also in writing this was, was thinking of journals like Kafka's or Virginia yeah, yeah. Wolf's. And if you think about Kafka's, um, I mean, there's, there, there's, there's some that are just, that seem might seem banal, but in the entire corpus of the diaries, uh, are beautiful uh, sure. uh, and, and magnificent. And while writing it, for you know, you you do think, oh, do I, you know, do I really include this? Does this, you know, does this have in, have enough gravitas? Of, I, I don't know. I included, for example jokes that a friend of mine from New York sent me, Trump jokes mm -hmm. uh, that she sent by emails. Uh, and, and evidently you think, oh, oh no, I'm not going to include a joke. But, you know, then that is, that is, I think, part of what the genre allows you. It's and and what, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think we will have to come to a close here because we will have to let Daniel get to his next class. Um, <laughs> oh other people to inspire as well, um, but we had the privilege tonight as well as Caroline Imke. Um, the book is Journal, um, Tagebuch in Zeiten der Pandemie. I would also like to recommend to our audience Three Rings, it's already been mentioned, um, by Daniel Mendelssohn and Ecstasy and Terror, also by him, his news too, more forthcoming. And if I may say, oh, yeah. this book will soon also be translated into German, The Elusive Embrace. Uh, I think it will be published in German in the fall. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, thank you. That, that was a service tweet right there. Um, und um, an unser Publikum gerichtet, um, ich möchte mich ganz herzlich bei Ihnen bedanken, dass Sie dabei waren. Um, hat mich sehr gefreut. Wir machen nach einer kurzen Pause um, am 22. und 29. weiter mit den Transatlantic Tuesdays, dann mit Stephen Wertheim und mit Marina Hertz. Um, wenn es Ihnen gefallen hat und Sie eine kleine Spende von 5 Euro da lassen wollen, können Sie das machen. Die Anweisungen sind in der E-Mail, die Sie erhalten haben. So bringen Sie uns auch ein wenig durch die Corona-Zeiten. Um, mein größter Dank, my biggest thank you, my, that, that didn't really uh, work grammatically. My biggest thank you um, goes out to Caroline Emke, um, who was so gracious with her time and with being here, here and sharing her thoughts on the pandemic and to Daniel Mendelssohn. Um, thank you so much. Um, I hope to see you both in person at some point. And our yes, yes, we'll come with in the fall with a new book uh, of Daniel. Uh, Great. See so you then. then. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Yeah.